Hello everyone, the objective of this presentation is to introduce you to the analysis of mixed data with machine learning approaches. The presentation is composed of two parts. In the first part, we'll consider main challenges of machine learning for mixed data. First, uh, we'll briefly discuss the difference between the concepts of artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning. We will then recall main types of machine learning problems and also main types of omics data. After that, we will look closely at the main challenges of machine learning specifically for omics data, as the robustness, dealing with limited sample size, and data scaling. To illustrate these points, I shall use a real use case of leukemia dataset. Next time, in the second part, I will show you some examples how to train basic linear and non-linear models for leukemia classification. After the presentation, you will have a practical session, data challenge. During this session, it will be your turn to train algorithms for a very similar problem of lung cancer classification. The examples that we will study together here may be helpful for you. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are two very popular words nowadays and often seem to be used interchangeably. Sometimes it may lead to confusion because they are not exactly the same thing. Artificial intelligence is a broad concept of machines being able to carry out tasks in a way that we would consider smart. Artificial intelligence refers to intelligent machines in general that are able to mimic human behavior. Machine learning is a specific part of artificial intelligence. It refers to a particular class of algorithms that are able to learn from data without explicit rules. To its turn, deep learning is a subclass of machine learning algorithms that can learn from data using different types and architectures of neural networks. This part is probably the most popular and the most effective in artificial intelligence for a large number of applications. In this presentation, we will focus on machine learning approaches, including simple neural networks and other uh, well-known algorithms. There are several main classes of learning problems. Let's see three of them. Supervised learning, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. For supervised machine learning problems, we usually have data and labels for each sample. For example, if you consider a data set of different cancer samples, the data may be expression levels of genes, and the labels are the type of cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, and so on. In this case, the goal will be to predict the cancer type for a new sample from gene expressions. For our simple example of an apple, the goal of the supervised learning would be to identify that the object on the image is actually an apple. The data here are the pixels of the image and the label is the name of the object apple. For unsupervised uh, learning problems, we don't have labels, we have only data. The goal is to understand the underlying structure of the data. All types of clustering methods are in fact unsupervised learning problems. For example, molecular types of cancer are usually defined by unsupervised clustering methods. For our example with an apple, an unsupervised algorithm will be able to identify which image is similar to another image, but cannot identify the name of the object. The reinforcement learning is usually applied to dynamic systems. The data are composed of couples, state and action. The goal is to find an optimal strategy to maximize rewards over time. Uh, for our Apple example, the algorithm would, be, um, would propose us the best strategy, for example, eat this object in order to stay alive. Applied to cancer studies, such algorithms are useful, for example, to model a strategy for cancer cells to become immortal or to disseminate metastasis. In this presentation, we'll see essentially supervised learning algorithms, and we will use some unsupervised algorithms which are helpful to visualize data. There are many types of omics data and several specific approaches of machine learning that target particular data types. Today we'll consider transcriptomic data as an example, which measure expression levels of genes and some classical machine learning approaches that can be used for different omics, not only for transcriptomic, but also for proteomic data, methylation data, and so on. In the literature, you can find some studies that also mix different ki kind of omics, for example, to realize a joint analysis of transcriptome and methylome together. 
It is completely possible with artificial intelligence approaches, but a little bit more complicated. Today we will focus on a simple case. This slide shows the accuracy of different classical techniques for leukemia diagnosis. The accuracy varies from 61 to 95 percent. Our goal will be to use transcriptomic data and to predict leukemia diagnosis with machine learning algorithms. I will use the example of leukemia transcriptomic data recorded with microarray technology. The data are provided by the NCBI-GEO public repository. It contains expression levels for more than 20,000 genes for three leukemia types, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and acute myeloid leukemia. The goal is to predict leukemia type. This type of classification problem is called supervised learning, when we have data and labels for each sample. Uh, now we will randomly split our total data set of 1740 samples in two data sets. We will keep 1640 samples for training and optimization of our machine learning algorithm and we will leave out 100 samples for the final evaluation. We can imagine that these uh, 100 samples represent new patients with leukemia for which we should identify their leukemia types. In both training and leave out data set will keep the same proportion of three leukemia types. During the data challenge you will have also the same kind of situation. You will be, you will be given a training data set of approximately 500 samples with labels and a final test data set with 100 samples without labels. You should predict the type of cancer for these new samples and you will be evaluated on the accuracy of your prediction. Let's first visualize the data with two techniques, a PCA, principal component analysis, and a clustering. On both figures we can see the same thing. The yellow data points corresponding to chronic lymphocytic leukemia are quite separated from the others. It means that it will be rather simple to identify this class with machine learning techniques. But the two other classes seem to be mixed. It will be probably a little bit more difficult to uh, separate them. When we work with omics data, there are some problems or challenges that we should take into account and to pay special attention to during data analysis. We will discuss here three of them and we will start with the robustness and generalization problem. It may happen that when we train a classifier, it works very well on the training data set. Unfortunately, it doesn't mean that it will also work well on another independent data set. Globally, we can encounter three kinds of situations. The first figure represents a situation when the model underfits the data. The model here is a straight line, and it doesn't respect very well the nature of the phenomenon, which is obviously non-linear. In this case, the model is underfitted and will not provide good results. In the opposite situation, on the last figure, the model is probably too complicated and it overfits the data. The model fits too closely the points and reproduces the noise. It tends to memorize specific points of noise instead of learning from data. In this case, the model gives excellent results in training dataset, but it will provide poor results in a new dataset with different points. Finally, we search an intermediate situation where the model is sufficiently complex to reproduce the biological phenomenon, but at the same time, it is sufficiently simple to avoid the memorization of noise. The model has good generalization properties because it provides good results in both training and test datasets. Now the question is how can we know if our model is underfitted, overfitted or just fine? We can, for example, compare the accuracy obtained with our model in training and in test datasets. The accuracy means how many samples are correctly predicted by the model. If the model is underfitted, it has a poor accuracy in both datasets. When it is overfitted, the prediction in training dataset will be very high, but the accuracy obtained for test dataset will be low. You may notice in this case an important difference between the datasets. Finally, if the model is robust and has good generalization properties, it works well on both datasets, then we expect to obtain similar accuracy rates. They are not necessarily perfect, but the accuracy is stable in different datasets. This is the best expected model for us. 
we need to estimate the accuracy rates in the data to evaluate if our model is robust. How to do this? At this stage, to optimize the model, we are allowed to use only the training data set. A classical approach and a good practice is to do a cross-validation. The cross-validation consists in splitting the initial training data set in several parts. Here we split in three parts. The split is random and we use two parts for training and one part for test. Then we permute the training and test parts. For three-fold cross-validation presented in this example, we will have three permutations. Therefore, we can measure the accuracy in training and test datasets three times and to calculate average accuracy. I strongly recommend you to do a cross-validation during your practical session. If you are limited in time, you can at least split the initial training data set in two parts, training and test, to be able to estimate the performance of your model. During the data challenge, you can use any programming language or tool that you want, for example, R or Python. I personally use Python with a famous framework for machine learning named Scikit-learn. So here in the presentation, I'll leave you an example of code with Python to perform a cross-validation with three splits. If you also use Python, you may check it. Scikit-learn contains by default many types of cross-validations that are ready to use. First, we need to create an instance of a cross-validation and to indicate the number of faults or number of splits as a parameter. Here I choose a three-fold stratified cross-validation, which preserves the proportions of labels in each dataset, training and test. Then we use the method split to randomly split the initial dataset X into training and test datasets. With a for loop, we then consequently access three iterations. Each iteration corresponds to one possible permutation. Uh, now let's talk about the second problem or challenge that we often encounter with omics data analysis. In omics data, the number of samples is usually much less than the number of model parameters, the number of genes in our case. The difference in sizes may be very important, more than 10 times. In theory, we can train a mathematically correct model only if the number of parameters is less or equal to the number of samples. Otherwise, the data are insufficient to properly constrain the model. The problem is ill-posed and we may obtain an infinite number of solutions, which in addition are not real solutions, but may be the artifacts. Usually, the model is strongly overfitted in this case. The difficulty is that we don't have enough data, enough information to constrain all the parameters of our model. There are several approaches to resolve or at least to reduce this problem. First, we can simplify the model by reducing the number of parameters. For example, we can select only a few parameters. The immediate question will be how to select these parameters and we need to answer this question later. We can also combine parameters to reduce their total number, for example, to use the most important principal components of the PCA. A second possibility would be to add somehow a supplementary information to our model. For example, we can add constraints on the model behavior by accepting linear solutions only, or to add a regularization to control the smoothness of the model and sometimes to reduce the number of parameters in the same time. Finally, there are also specific approaches for neural networks that help to avoid memorization of the data during the learning process, for example, dropouts and early stopping techniques. In our simple case, I propose you to reduce the number of parameters using variance. The main idea here is to select only genes with an important variation in expression level across samples. In the first approximation, we can speculate that if the expression level of a gene is the same for all the samples, then probably this gene is less useful for prediction. It's not always true, but we can accept this idea for our example. So we select the genes with high variance. How many genes we should select? Uh, well, it's a rather difficult question. It strongly depends on data and on user model. Here we can empirically consider a good number of genes to be roughly one third of the number of samples, approximately 500 genes. Now, if we visualize data using selected genes only, we may notice that the separation between groups 
is a little better. It is even more visible on clustering images. The groups of leukemia are much better separated when we reduce the noise. The reduction of parameters by variance is not a unique strategy. We can apply other approaches. For example, instead of calculating variance across samples, we can also select genes with important variation expression levels across groups, as presented on the first figure. This gene uh, seems to be interesting for classification. On the second figure, the expression levels are almost the same for all groups, thus uh, this gene is probably less interesting for classification. Formally, it can be done by statistical test, t-test or ANOVA in groups, selecting genes with low p-values. Sometimes we can introduce a threshold for noise and to select only genes with expression levels above this threshold. Another very popular method for parameter reduction is to use an output of a linear model. In this case, we first train a linear model, for example, logistic regression using all the parameters, probably with a regularization. And then we select only the parameters which are most important for prediction according to this linear model. And finally, the selected parameters may be used to train a more accurate non-linear model. The last point or challenge that we talk about uh, will be the data scaling. In omics data, the parameters have usually different scales. This may result in a poor convergence for machine learning methods. So we need to scale data before training any machine learning algorithm. Here is a basic technique to scale data by centering and reducing. First, we use a training data set only to measure the mean and standard deviation across samples for each gene separately. Then we calculate a scaled value of expression by removing the mean and by dividing by the standard deviation in both training and test datasets. For test datasets, we don't recalculate the mean and standard deviation. We use those obtained in the training dataset. Otherwise, the data point will be shifted. And also, it's important not to use the entire data set to recalculate, to calculate the mean and standard deviation, but the training data set only. Otherwise, we introduce a leakage of information. So be careful with the scaling and do it properly. In Python, scaling is very simple. We first need to create a scalar. Then the scalar automatically fits the training data set. Finally, we apply the transformation uh, to both training and test datasets. We understand now the essential points for omics data preparation. Let's create the entire pipeline. Initially, we have a training dataset for model training and a leave-out dataset for which we should predict the levels. To be able to train and to optimize the classifier, let's split the initial training dataset one more time with a cross-validation or just a simple split to create internal training and test datasets. This will be necessary to evaluate the performance of our classifier. In the next step, we can reduce the number of parameters, if necessary. Remember that the parameter reduction should be done on the training dataset only. If we are inside the cross-validation, then we use a training dataset of the cross-validation, different at each iteration. Later, when our model is completely established, then we will retrain the model on the initial training dataset without cross-validations, and at this time we will need to perform a new variable reduction. The final step in our pipeline is the data scaling. The mean and standard deviation are also measured in the training dataset only. If we are inside the cross-validation, then the data scaling should be repeated for each iteration. For the final training, we will perform a data scaling on the initial training dataset. We know now how to prepare omics data for machine learning algorithms. Let's stop here for the first part. In the next video, we'll train several models and compare their performance on our leukemia dataset.